Hi there, I'm Ron Wright. I teach here at Wake Forest University School of Law. Today we're going to be talking about a topic in criminal procedure about holding people in detention, like in a jail cell or other holding facility, before trial. And not because we think they're going to try to escape, but because we're worried about the possible future crimes that they, com they might commit while they're out pending trial. So this is, the topic is called preventive detention. Uh, and we'll be talking about when that is constitutionally allowed. Let's go in and talk about preventive detention. Okay, folks, let's get started. We're going to be talking today about uh, preventive detention. Now, we're at the point in the process where the police have done their work, and they've gathered the evidence, and they've put together a file, uh, and they have perhaps arrested the defendant. Not every time, but let's say they've arrested the defendant. The defendant is in a holding cell, cell in the jail. Uh, and the question becomes, all right, we've got a trial coming up in a few weeks or more likely several months. And what should we do with this defendant between now and the date of trial? Should we release him? Should we hold on to him for a while? And the traditional way that we answer that question has revolved around bail and, other, and forms of non-financial release. And what we've been aiming for traditionally is, are we sure the person's going to really show up? Like if we let you go and you're charged with a crime and you're supposed to be tried three months from now, are you just going to leave and go to Mexico or you know, just flee the jurisdiction in some way, hide out, never show up again? Or will you really show up on you know, April the 12th on the date of your trial. And so if we're pretty much convinced that somebody will show up, that they will not flee, then we say, okay, we'll release you. I, either we'll charge you bail and, you know, take some money away from you if you don't show up, or we won't even charge you any money, but we'll just tell you while you're out there, don't, you know, do these things, don't go to this bar where you get into trouble all the time, or, you know, whatever the conditions are. But very often you might release somebody if you're convinced that they're going to show up for trial. But what we're talking about today is something a little different. This is not somebody who we're worried about whether or not they're going to show up for trial. This is somebody who we think, yeah, he'll show up to trial. He'll be here on April 12th. But in the meantime, he's going to go out there and commit a lot of new crimes. Lots of new crimes. And so what we want to do is just hold on to him for a while until we can get him tried for this case. And if we get a conviction, then we can sentence him to some kind of prison term and we'll put him into the you know, prison system. And then we will have prevented some crimes. So that's the name of the concept, preventive detention. So is that possible? Can you do it? The short answer is, in most places, yes. Uh, certainly for purposes of the federal constitution, it's okay under the federal constitution. The U.S. Congress first passed uh, a statute allowing this kind of preventive detention, going beyond the traditional show up for trial uh, kind of detention. Uh, first passed this statute in 1984 under the Bail Reform Act, and it got its first test in a case called United States versus Salerno. So there's a unit in the Department of Justice where they uh, pick out cases to pursue on appeal, to try to get favorable interpretations of statutes and to get the government's position embodied in case law. And I imagine there's a lawyer sitting at her desk looking at cases here, pulling this file out and paging through it and trying to decide, is this the right case to test the validity of the new bail reform statute? And I just imagine this smile coming across the face of this attorney when this case comes up. Because Salerno is a very famous uh, uh, boss of a organized crime network, a mafia boss, uh, at least allegedly, but a very famous defendant who has been charged with one crime. And we're concerned that this person who runs a big criminal organization will be able to leave jail or leave, you know, the holding cell, the, the uh, prison pretrial detention area, and go back in, out into the world and continue committing very serious crimes. So we say, this is somebody we want to hold on to. We want to be able to control this person until we can try him and possibly send him to prison. So uh, there's a challenge. Salerno challenges the validity of the pretrial detention. He says, there's no question that I'm going to show up. I've been in 
criminal proceedings before. I've always shown up before. All of my ties are here. Where would I go? I mean, everybody I know and love is here, and I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here for trial. And the, court, and the, the prosecution says, you're right. Yeah, you're going to show up for trial, but we're worried about other stuff. We're worried about the, um, uh, about the crimes that you might commit, and we can show the court by clear and convincing evidence that, that we think you're going to commit these future crimes. So we're going to have a hearing where we convince the court that you're charged with a serious past crime and there's concrete reasons to believe that you will commit some pretty serious future crimes while you're out on release and therefore you ought to be able to, we ought to be able to hold on to Salerno pending trial for the old charges. The court says this is constitutionally acceptable. There were two different challenges. Neither one of them ended up knocking the statute out. The first related to something called the bail clause. So the, uh, so the Constitution says that excessive bail shall not be required. But, says the court, that doesn't mean that you have a right to bail. It doesn't mean that everybody gets to be offered some kind of bail release. What it really means is if the judge is going to offer bail, then the bail should be appropriate to the case. It should be appropriate to the seriousness of the crime that you committed and the likelihood that you're going to, you know, not show up for trial or, you know, whatever the, the, uh, the purpose of the release might be. If you're going to release them, you can't charge excessive bail. But it, the, the court says the bail clause of the federal constitution does not actually require the court to offer release to every defendant. So that challenge is off the board, not a winner. By the way, under a lot of state constitutions, there is a winning argument here because a lot of state constitutions, for purposes of criminal cases in that state, do, these state constitutions do have an actual guarantee of bail in most cases. They typically will exempt capital cases, but other than that, there is very often a state constitutional right to bail, a very commonly encountered clause in state constitutions. But that kind of language is not present in the, federal, in the U.S. Constitution, the federal Constitution. Second argument, putting aside the excessive bail clause, there's also a due process clause where the, where the defendant says, you know, there's a problem here, and that is I haven't been found guilty of anything yet, and I'm sitting here in prison behind bars. Isn't there a problem here when you're punishing me before you've actually proven that I've done anything? And so the court says, well, the question here is whether we're holding you because we're punishing you, is it punitive, or instead are we holding you because it's regulatory, because we're trying to promote public safety. How do we know the difference between a punitive detention and a regulatory public safety detention? Well, the court says, first, we ask whether Congress gave us a label. If Congress says, oh, this is punitive, we're punishing, then that's the end of it. We know that it's punitive because that's, they told us that was their purpose. But normally Congress doesn't say that. So instead you say, all right, if they don't tell you whether it's punitive or not, if it's not written into the statute, then you just ask, well, what are the objectives here, public safety, and is the amount and type of detention, the type of restriction of liberty, on liberty, is it reasonable and not excessive in relationship to the regulatory goal? Is it the kind of thing that is limited in time and we have a pretty strong reason for worrying about public safety in this setting? And so the court says, we're going to answer that question by looking at historical examples. There are really some dueling analogies here, several different possible points of comparison here to find out whether, um, whether uh, this kind of Salerno uh, public safety detention is allowable as a sort of pretrial regulation rather than pretrial punishment. So the first possibility here is what would happen if agents were just walking around the street and they said, that guy over there, we think he's going to commit a crime next Thursday. Grab him, we'll hold him in prison until next Friday, and then we're all safe. You know, like Minority Report, the uh, you know, famous 2004 movie. Uh, we will grab people beforehand and hold them until the danger has passed. Well, obviously we can't do that. That's, you know, 
nothing that we that courts would allow a pretty obvious no there so uh, if that's what we're doing here if that's what the government's really trying to do with Salerno they can't they can't do it inconsistent with our traditions it would be excessive use of of uh, detention um, practices another possibility what happens if I I look around at people who were charged with a crime. We tried them, but the jury came back with a verdict, not guilty. And then later with that same person, we say, you know, I've got some proof now that he's going to commit another crime next Thursday. He was charged and acquitted in the past, and I now have evidence that he's going to commit a future crime. Can I now grab that person? pull them off the street? And again, the answer is very clearly, no, you can't do that. I mean, the fact that somebody was charged in the past doesn't mean anything. The acquittal kind of wipes that off the books. So that person is just the same as anybody else who's walking around on the street and we just are trying to guess whether they're going to commit future crimes. You can't put them in prison for that. So again, a very clear no to this possible analogy. The third possibility is what happens if you've got somebody who committed a crime in the past? I'll use a real case here. Let's say it's child sex abuse. And the person is tried and convicted, serves the sentence. Let's say it's a 15-year sentence. Gets to the end of the sentence. It's year 14, day 364. Tomorrow he's going to be released. And the state comes in and says, you know, we've got a we've got some testimony from the doctors here that you are still very sick and that as soon as you leave you're going to go out and abuse more children you're going to be doing some harm and so your criminal sentence is about to end but now we're going to start a new phase of detention for you and that is some kind of preventive detention and we will hold you for a year at a time we have to show the judge once each year that you are still dangerous that we are trying to help you overcome your condition that we're giving you some kind of treatment but we can hold on to you a year at a time proving to a judge that we have a basis to believe that you are dangerous in the future going forward can we do that interestingly the court has said yes here and this one is you know a lot of people think this was a mistake I mean this one is a very close call but certainly the court has ruled that that kind of of a preventive detention is allowed. So if, if that's kind of what we're doing with, with Salerno, then we would say, yeah, that's uh, you know, an acceptable form of regulatory uh, detention or preventive detention. Another possible analogy, suppose you've got somebody who is arrested for a crime, charged with a crime, and while they're in pretrial detention, they say, if you let me out of here, I'm leaving the country right away. I'm going to buy a plane ticket and I'm gone. Or, if you let me out of here, I'm going to go and beat up the witnesses or maybe kill the witnesses for the state so that you can't prove your case. If they give you some kind of indication that they're going to flee or otherwise mess up the trial, well then again, it's very clear that traditionally we can hold on to somebody. So if, if that's kind of what we're doing with Salerno, again, that would be allowable. That's a yes. Another area where we do allow detention is for people who are dangerously mentally ill. If you can come into court, somebody who has not committed a crime in the past, we think they might commit a crime in the future, we can show to a judge that this person is a danger to himself or to others. Uh, if we can make that showing to the judge, then we can hold on to somebody even against their will and involuntarily commit them. If you can show that there's a, you know, uh, diagnosable mental disease or defect that is leading to this person being dangerous to other people or to themselves. So again, if that's what we're doing with Salerno, that would be allowed. So which of these is really the best analogy? Probably the, the uh, ones that come closest would be the uh, person who was convicted in the past, completed their criminal sentence, but they still are dangerous and so we hold them a year at a time. Our, child sex offense case. That's a pretty close analogy. Uh, or, you know, perhaps it is, it is something like, you know, somebody who was charged in the past and acquitted, and now we think that we have strong reasons to believe they're going to commit a future crime. We're kind of right in between those two analogies. The court ends up saying this one is consistent enough with our past practice or with our uh, use of detention generally that we will allow it to happen. The defendant objects and says, wait a minute, 
presumption of innocence. You know, I'm supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, and we haven't even had the trial yet. So to quote Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, you know, we say, the defendant here might complain, the king's messenger is in prison now, being punished, and the trial doesn't even begin, begin until next Wednesday, and of course the crime comes last of all. This is out of order. You're punishing me before the trial. The trial happens before the crime itself. Something's really wrong here. Um, but the court replies, well, that's not quite what the presumption of innocence means. It doesn't mean that we can't do anything to you while the charges are pending. What it means is that during the trial, we have to treat you like an innocent person. You get to dress like an innocent person, and we don't refer to you as the person who committed the crime. We, we, we refer to you as the accused, not the proven guilty. So we have trials that are built on a presumption of innocence. But it doesn't mean that we can't treat you any differently outside the courtroom. And so the court says this kind of short-term detention based on specific proven uh, factors to, believe, to make us believe that a future crime is coming added together with at least probable cause to believe that you committed a past serious crime. You put all that proof together and it will support some kind of pretrial detention for this uh, defendant. So the court said Bail Reform Act, still constitutional, consistent with due process. It doesn't amount to punishment without proof. It, it amounts to a regulatory detention. So that's what the court ends up holding. We now have several state statutes and state constitutions uh, that do allow for this same kind of pretrial detention that is aimed at preventing crime rather than preventing flight from the, uh, from the court. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we have statutes that will specify the types of crimes that might be accused in the past. You know, and this kind of detention is only available if you're being held for one of those very serious crimes. Uh, but in other settings, the uh, state law does not specify any particular kind of past crime. It just points to the, the uh, findings of future dangerousness that a judge has to make. But again, remember, you got to go to a judge. You got to present specific proof that this person is at risk of committing a future uh, crime. Uh, there's always the alternative of traditional bail. If you're, not try, if you're not really able to show that kind of future dangerousness, you still have the possibility of proving that somebody is a risk of flight or a risk of some kind of uh, witness intimidation or other interference in the, uh, in the trial process. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of some of the detention options for the government during the pretrial period. We'll talk next time. Mm -hmm.